Uh, so as you can see on this slide and, and many of the future slides, uh, these are the photos shot by that great set of photographers that we just saw the video for. I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, as you heard, I'm, I'm uh, the very first S3 customer, so we've been doing this a long time, for more than 18 years. Pretty remarkable. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that I want to talk about is, is our size and scale. When we started working with AWS all those years ago, we were an enormous customer for them at a whopping 70 million photos. Today, we're at 50 billion photos. So you can imagine the size of the scale um, uh, over the years. In fact, we now have more than 100 million people a month using our services and our, our platforms, all built on top of AWS. So let that sink in for a minute. When we started 18 years ago, we had 70 million photos. And now we have more than 100 million people every month using it. The, the size and ability for us to grow and scale on AWS has been transformational for us. We uh, have a couple hundred petabytes of data under management now, so it's really getting enormous. Now, some of these big numbers were helped a lot by our acquisition of another platform, Flickr, about six years ago, which we now own and operate on top of AWS as well. And when we first got started way back in 2006, we were most excited about storing all of those photos, 70 million, which seemed huge at the time, 50 billion now. Uh, but it eventually dawned on us that there was a lot more we could do with S3 than just storing photos. Now, back then, there was no sort of terminology or best practice guides or anything about big data. In fact, I don't think the term even existed in 2006. So we didn't have anybody to draft off of. We didn't have best practices or consultants or anything like that to, to figure this out. We had to learn by doing, and we made a lot of mistakes along the way. But it quickly dawned on us that we could use S3 for a lot more than just storing photos, that having an unlimited, bottomless, inexpensive storage tier meant that we could transform the way we managed our data. Our first big light bulb moment was realizing that if we got out of our data center mindset, and we had seven data centers at the time, that we could keep all of our data. We had gotten in some sort of bad habits around optimizing our data footprint because it was just so costly to run in our own data centers, where we would keep fresh data around for, say, one to three months, and then summarize it and age it out and eventually delete it because we just didn't have the storage capacity to keep it around. But being on S3 enabled us to, say, take our web access logs and keep them for forever. We knew that that, that data was super useful in sort of a one-month time frame or maybe a three-month time frame, but it didn't really dawn on us that being able to compare data year over year, or in our case, decade over decade, would turn out to be super valuable as well. So we learned to keep all of our data, stop deleting it. Ooh, big win for us. And our next light bulb moment was realizing that we should really keep the data in its original format. We had similarly, like being used to being in our data centers, we tried to optimize the format either to make it smaller or maybe to um, make it work with our current software stack, which wasn't very future forward and future looking because of course software evolved and our software stack would evolve. And so we learned quickly the hard way that we should just keep all of our original data in its original format because that gave us a lot more flexibility and we didn't have to worry quite so much about cost because it was in S3. And on top of that, we realized that we had better get better at keeping our metadata about all of this data we were accumulating around, things like timestamps and the origin of the data generation and all of that sort of stuff. So we got good at keeping all the data and keeping it in its original formats. And luckily, we uh, were so gl glad that we did because we had no idea back then that tools like Athena would come along that would literally let us query the original format data without even having to transform it. It was transformational. Uh, and then sort of our next big light bulb moment or epiphany was when we realized that we had inadvertently restricted our data and put up sort of access controls and gatekeepers and everything in front of it that were limiting our team's ability to get their job done and ask the data questions and get answers from it. And we did it out of an abundance of caution because we wanted things to be safe and secure. And we do deal with sensitive data. We're dealing with consumers and, and customers all the time. 
but there's a lot of data in there, average order value, sales volume, most popular photo of the day, or things like that that weren't sensitive, but we were still keeping it all locked up. So we learned that we really need to get as much of the data unlocked and share it with our people, our product teams, our business leaders, so they could make the fast, quick, great decisions that the data really existed to serve. And then last, but certainly not least, uh, after we made it accessible, we, di we discovered that that wasn't uh, quite enough, right? We needed to go one step further and make it easy to get access to. It turned out that some of our sales, marketing, finance teams didn't love creating SQL queries to get access to some of this data. So we had to meet them where their tooling lived. We had to integrate with tools like QuickSight and create dashboards and uh, natural language uh, interfaces and things to really enable all of those teams to really unlock all of the value that, that we were now creating and storing in these vast, vast pools of data. So just recently, a couple of weeks ago, you know, I mentioned that we had acquired Flickr six years ago. A couple of weeks ago, a team at Flickr analyzed tens of billions of data points across hundreds of millions of customers to answer a crucial, critical question for us that had long eluded us. Um, when we acquired Flickr, it was an amazing community, but it was kind of a disaster of a business. It was in decline. It was losing a lot of money. Um, and today, I'm super thrilled that it is growing again, and for the first time in 20 years, it's profitable. But it should be growing faster, and we'd like it to be even more profitable so we can continue to invest in that wonderful community. So this tiny team at Flickr took advantage of all this work we'd done to create huge pools of accessible, easy-to-get-to data and answered this massive question for us, which is we have more than 100 million people using the service and platform who don't pay us anything. And then we have a much smaller cohort of members who gladly pay us a monthly or annual subscription fee, and we haven't really understood the behavioral differences between the two. We think we do now as a result of having all this data unlocked and accessible to our teams. We think we've identified a set of behaviors that are unique for those paying customers, and we are hard at work designing new product experiences to really unlock that value. And we're really excited about it. So I'll just leave you with a couple of our suggestions. If you want to transform your organization like we're transforming ours, keep as much data as possible. Don't transform it, or if you do transform it immediately, at least keep the original data around, especially keep the metadata, and uh, make it accessible to as many people in your, in your organization as you can, and meet your people where they are. After all, it's the people making the decisions that the data enables for massive transformation. Thank you so much.